All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. This is the second class in our five week series for um, beginning vegetable gardening for Flagstaff and the higher elevations of Northern Arizona. And tonight I'm going to be presenting on starting seeds and some general plant care. This is one of my favorite topics to teach because I was a grower for several years here in Northern Arizona. And I just really love talking about starting seeds and growing your own plants. So with that, we can get started. So with the beginning of this talk, I kind of want to throw a question out there to you guys. And maybe you can just put a few of your answers in the chat box. And um, we have Hattie here as our co-host. So um, she can maybe unmute herself and maybe just shout out what you guys are putting in the chat box. So. The beginning of this talk is going to be all about starting your own seeds for your vegetable garden. And what are, what are some reasons why you might want to start your own seeds? Can you think of any benefits or advantages to starting your own seeds at home? So you can just go ahead and throw some of your ideas in the chat box and then Hattie will share. Whoa. There's lots of, <laughs> you can start your seeds organically, which you don't always know. If you are um, shopping at the nursery, you can choose your short season cultivars, limited to supply at our nurseries, that's for sure. Um, I like this one, you get the full experience. Yeah. Yes, that's really great. And less expensive than buying plants, that's for sure. Um, and then no GMOs. I do have to say that there aren't very many vegetables that will grow that are GMO plants, but that might change over time. And then more variety, you know what you're eating, they're cheaper, and you don't have to worry about those late freezes as much. That's if you plan and time things well, like Jim taught us, right? Yes. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks. More selection grow your favorite vegetables. Though I have to say when I picked up Veggie Start CSAs and you get some weird plant you never heard of, you grow it. It's <laughs> kind of cool. Grow something new. Okay. All right, well, good job, everybody. I think that you um, pretty much hit the target of every bullet point that I have on my slideshow. So, Absolutely. There are definitely more options than what you can find in the nursery. So that's really going to give you a lot of freedom to be able to grow some of your favorite specialty plants or heirloom varieties that you might not find in the nursery. Another advantage, especially for us when we're gardening at the higher elevations, um, you can customize your garden plants to our really challenging climate. Our local nurseries are pretty good about doing this, but a lot of times if you're shopping at the big box stores, you can find some pretty inappropriate um, plants in there for your garden. You can get a jump on the growing season. Somebody mentioned that, and we need all the help that we can get with our short growing season here in Northern Arizona. And it's a lot cheaper to start your own plants by seed than it is to purchase transplants um, from the nursery. So you can save money. Um, you can collect seed and from your, your, from your vegetable garden in the fall, and then you can share those seeds with your friends and grow those plants out the next year. And, um, you can grow from shared community seeds, like from our seed library that we have at the Cooperative Extension Office in um, Flagstaff. A lot of those seeds that we have have been collected season after season from Flagstaff. <clears throat> and those 
Um, all those future generations of plants are adapted, are beginning to become adapted to our climate. So there are a lot of really great reasons why um, you should start your own seeds. And you know what, when I taught this class in PAGE, um, for the PAGE series, I really wanted to put it's fun. So that's another reason why you should start your own seeds, but I did not put that on there. I will next time. So you don't really need a whole lot of stuff to um, start your own seeds and it can be relatively inexpensive to get started. So you basically just need containers and we'll look at a bunch of different container types in the slideshow. So you can um, either buy commercially made nursery pots or you can um, recycle yogurt containers or just a, a lot or reuse or repurpose, I, I should say, um, yogurt containers, egg cartons, pie tins, um, a lot of different household items that you use in your kitchen can really be pots. So you can be pretty creative, but just remember to um, punch holes in the bottom of your containers for that um, drainage. You need growing media or seeds, seed starting mix, potting soil, that's all the same. That's all um, growing media is the term for, for, um, for what I just mentioned. We'll talk a lot about growing media in this talk. A spray bottle for watering and fertilizing. So that's pretty inexpensive. Of course, you'll need your seeds. What's really gonna be a game changer for you for starting your own seeds indoors is going to be uh, providing that bottom heat that some seeds need in order to germinate or maximize your germination. So you can get that with a heat mat. We'll look at an example of a heat mat and they are relatively inexpensive to buy. Supplemental light, um, really inexpensive fluorescent lights are okay. We'll look at some examples in this talk and you just wanna make sure that um, your light is two to four inches above your plants so that they're not stretching or reaching and becoming very leggy. And we'll look at um, pictures of um, a couple of different setups for supplemental light because sometimes putting your seeds in your window is not providing the plants with an enough light to grow big and strong. So this talk mostly is going to be about starting seeds in doors. And here on this slide, we're going to talk about germination. And with germination, there are four key elements that we really need to think about and provide for our seeds to get optimum germination. So water, oxygen, temperature, and light are the four key elements to get your seeds to germinate. So when we look at water, we wanna make sure that our growing media or our seed starting mix um, is not overwatered, but it's not underwatered either because seeds need to imbibe water. So they need to take on water in order to germinate. Oxygen, so when I talk about overwatering, oxygen is, or think about seeds, they're living things, so they need oxygen. And if you're putting too much water on your seeds, then you're going to um, kind of create an anaerobic situation and um, your seeds will not germinate. On the flip side of that, if you're not adding enough water, then your tiny seedlings, um, if they do, did germinate, they're gonna be really fragile and they can dry out and die. So you kind of wanna find that happy medium, kind of like a damp sponge. If you're wringing water out um, of your, your seed starting mix, then it's too wet. And if it's kind of like dust, then it is way too dry. Temperature is going to be really important for starting seeds. So you can, on average, um, 60, 75 degrees is what most seeds will need in order to germinate. But there are some seeds that or plants that really, really like um, the heat, like peppers, for example. 
Um, they like it a little hotter. And the way that you can provide that is with a heat mat. So you can see this was uh, the growing uh, bench that I grew on at the Arboretum. I've got some basil seeds going here. And this is a big, long heat mat. I probably got like four of them um, all connect lined up, but that's for me, it, that was in a commercial situation. For the home gardener, you can buy mats that are much smaller to suit your needs. And they're relatively inexpensive. They're anywhere from like 30 to all the way, I mean, for the longer ones, they can get up to over a hundred dollars. But for the home grower, you can find a smaller one that's relatively inexpensive. Um, when it, where it really starts to get expensive is if you um, buy a therm uh, thermostat or thermometer for, for that. And you can see I've got this probe here. So I, you can plug the probe into your growing media and then set the temperature. And so say you've got a packet of seeds and it says that the optimum germination temperature is going to be 80 degrees. Well, then you can set that um, therm uh, thermostat to um, that particular temperature so you can really um, control the heat for germination. Light, so the last um, of the four key elements is light. And here, some seeds, so just remember that some seeds need light to germinate, but some seeds also um, need darkness in order to germinate. Um, I was growing um, chives and they require darkness in order to germinate. So what I did was I had my seed flats here and then I just um, made sure I kept the growing media moist, but I put the seed flat inside of a dark black garbage bag. And that's the way that I provided just the right amount of light or darkness in order to get those seeds to germinate. Um, all of this information will be on your seed packet. We're really going to look at and kind of dissect a seed packet. Um, so you'll learn that reading your seed packets is very important, um, but some seeds actually don't really care either way. So just remember to read your packet to get that information. There's a lot of really important information on your seed packet. So that's why I'm gonna recommend buying your seeds from a reputable um, source because they will have really great cultivation um, tips on the back of the seed packet, which will really help you succeed when you're starting your own seeds. So some of the information that's on the back of your seed packet um, could be whether or not you should grow your seeds out and then transplant them into your garden. So grow them out in your house, just like what we were talking about, and then transplant them into your garden or whether or not you should just direct seed them. So just stick the seed in the ground outside in your, in your garden. If you're growing your plants as transplants to be planted out later, a lot of times your seed packet will give you the number of days to transplant. So that's really going to help you with your timing. Those light requirements that I just explained to you, you'll see light requirements on some seed packets, optimum temperature. So that's where um, you're gonna get the most percentage of germinate or your highest uh, germination rate with um, optimum temperature and providing that for your seeds. Seed depth, um, it'll basically, the rule is twice as deep as the seed is wide. And the bigger the seed, the deeper you're gonna wanna go into your growing media or in, into the ground. But um, a lot of times your seed packets will tell you exactly how deep you should plant your seeds. Germination rates, sometimes some seeds are a lot harder to get to germinate. So uh, companies will test for germination rates so you can adjust for that. So say you've got a seed packet that has only, uh, when they did their test, 75% germination rate. Well, then you can plan on maybe just sowing your seeds a little harder or more, more seeds 
in order to uh, make sure that you're getting a crop with a lower germination rate. And then uh, sometimes you'll see whether or not a seed has been treated for disease or disease resistance, or sometimes you'll see pelleted on your seed packet. And what that means is that um, the, you'll see this with really, really tiny seeds. So they'll put a kind of a, a waxy coating around the seed. So then you can have more pr precision when you're sowing your seeds. So I really like Johnny Seeds. Um, Tomato Jim talked about Johnny Seeds last week. They're just a really great company and they have loads of information on their seed packet. This is a seed packet that I pulled off of line, offline. It's for zinnia, which is not a vegetable, but it's a really great example of all of the really good information that you can find on the back of your seed packet. So using this zinnia as an example, they are recommending that you can grow this plant as a transplant or you can direct seed it. Sometimes you'll see transplant and then it'll say not recommended. So what they're saying there is to just direct, direct sow or direct seed your, gar your seeds into the garden. So here they're saying for this zinnia that you're gonna wanna sow your seeds four weeks before the last frost. So you have to know what the last frost date average is in your area. And then you would sow your seed four weeks before that to get it ready to go into the garden. With this particular plant, this zinnia, you can also direct seed this. So here they're telling you to do it after the last frost when the soil is warm and then they tell you to go a quarter inch deep and then cover lightly, um, but firmly. So here, you, if they're asking you to cover lightly, it's gonna need um, some, some light in order for germination to take place. So here, down here in this, section, they've got the tips to optimize germination. So here they're saying in three to five days, if you've got your heat mat set at 80 to 85 um, degrees, um, you should get some germination in three to five days. So lots of really great information here. And then here's the germination um, rate that I was telling you about right here. So that this seed, when it was tested, had a 93% germination rate, which is really good. So you can direct seed or um, transplant seeds into your garden or grow them out um, to make transplants to plant out. There's lots of information online. And again, just read your seed packets. But here I just pulled, um, made a slide of some common vegetables and whether or not um, you should direct seed them or grow transplants out indoors to be planted later. So pumpkins, zucchini, squash, melons, beans, corn, lettuce, chives, beets, and carrots um, should be direct seeded into your garden. And for us, especially here in Northern Arizona, we're definitely not going to want to put um, tomatoes and peppers and eggplant seeds right into our gardens. We're going to want to grow those um, plants out as transplants and um, plant them out later. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, broccoli, leeks, onions, and kale are just a few examples of um, seeds that you should grow out as transplants. So how do we sow seeds? It's actually fairly easy. You're going to want to start with your moistened seed starting mix, and we'll talk about different growing medias in a, um, later on in this talk. So start with your moistened seed starting mix, fill your pots up. And here you can see that this person is using, um, repurposing some, it looks like maybe egg cartons. Um, make sure that you do have holes on the bottom of whatever pots that you're using. Make a hole in, the, um, in your pot with um, a pencil or something. Place the seeds in the hole, but um, you don't wanna put them down way too deep and you don't wanna make them too shallow. So just read your seed packet. Remember that'll um, give you that information. 
Um, sometimes you wanna put more than one seed per hole and then thin your plants out later. This is really hard to do. Um, it's, well, it's not hard to do. It's only, it's hard to do mentally because um, you're basically ripping out and killing a plant, but it, you should definitely do that. So thin your plants out. So if you've got like three, if you sowed three seeds per cell um, in, in your pot and you get all three seeds um, germinated, then go ahead and thin that out. So there's only one healthy plant inside of your pot. Um, when you cover your, you're gonna to wanna to cover your seeds and then water is gonna be really important. When you're starting your own seeds, watering with a really fine mist is going to be the best. And you can get this at home with just uh, buying a spray bottle and providing that um, fine mist. If you water with something that's got a lot of pressure, you run the risk of just knocking all of your seeds and all of your growing media out of your pots. Place your pots in a sunny location or under um, some kind of supplemental light. And remember to keep your soil moist. So don't just put them in the window and then forget about them. Remember, you're going to have to water them and um, kind of tend to them while they get going. So here are some um, places that I recommend to get seeds. Jim talked about this last week, but um, Johnny Seeds, I really like them. Um, seeds of Change is a good place to get seeds. Botanical Interests, I just found out about them. They are in Colorado. Pine Tree Seeds, that's one of Jim's favorites, so I recommend that now. And then um, you can get seeds if you, this would be a whole um, another class, but on um, harvesting seeds to share with your friends, um, but that's another place that you can get seeds. And we have a seed library here in our community. And if you um, want to start a seed library in your community, it's a really great thing to do. And it's a great way to share seeds with your local um, gardeners. If you go to our Coconino County Cooperative Extension website, you can see Hattie and I made a couple of videos last year all about um, our seed library, and then also, which was started by Jackie Alston, who's um, giving the presentation on season extension in a couple of weeks. Um, but Hattie and I made videos of our seed library and then also some tips on how you can save seed from your vegetable garden in the fall. So check that out on our Coconino County Cooperative Extension YouTube page. Here's some examples of um, some household, common household containers that you can reuse. So you can see there's some uh, yogurt containers over here. Here's egg cartons. This could be uh, butter or fake butter, um, cottage cheese, any, any container like that can easily be used to start your own seeds. And you can save them year after year just remember that um, you should sterilize your pots in between use with a 10% bleach solution. And that's just to kill any potential pathogens or um, insect pests that could be hiding out in, in your pots. Here's a slide of supplemental light. So this is a setup that you can um, buy from, it's, for the home gardener, um, Greenhouse Megastore, I believe, has set up a setup like this for sale. And it's a, just a longer fluorescent light. And usually they are adjustable. So you can keep them just above your plants. If your plants, if your light is up very far away from your seedlings, then what's going to happen is that they're going to stretch, they're going to get elongated, and they are not going to be um, very strong, vigorous plants. So remember that sometimes the light from the window is not enough. And um, if you are providing supplemental light, keep it about two to four inches from the top of your plants to avoid um, stretching. And you'll need about um, 16 hours of light 
every day. So just um, remember to turn that light off. Sometimes they come with timers. So um, it's good to turn the light off to get your plants, give them a little rest. All right, so you've got your containers, you've got your growing media, you started your seeds and they, and you've got your light and they've germinated. So now what do you do? Well, um, depending on what you're growing your plants in or what you started your seeds in, um, you may have to introduce some um, supplemental fertilizing. So this is where it's gonna be really important to understand your growing media and what the ingredients are. So again, just um, read your labels. I can't stress that enough. Whenever you're using any kind of product, really read the label and understand what you're using. Because some seedling mixes will come with um, a supplemental fertilizer for say the first two weeks um, of your plant's life. So just read that. When you're um, fertilizing, Seedlings, I really like to use a water soluble solution. And um, I just put this picture of Fox Farm Grow Big up here. Um, I, I like that. I used it a lot at the Arboretum. And one of the um, reasons why I really liked that plant food was you could, you were in charge of your mix. So you could either make a stronger mix for um, established plants, or they have a recipe for um, feeding your seedlings um, on the bottle. So again, read your label. And then there, it's really easy to mix that up with a, in a spray bottle and you can just spray it on your plants. In fact, they have a foliar spray recipe as well on the back of that um, grow big bottle. Um, you want to avoid fertilizing until at least the first, first true leaves appear because you don't want to burn your plants or damage them. They're very sensitive um, at the, that beginning stage. So here, I think these were tomato seedlings. These leaves right here are the cotyledons. That's what you're going to see first when the seed germinates, but then you can see the, this set of leaves right here. So that's what I mean by the first um, set of true leaves. Keep your potting soil um, moist and remember not too wet. If you are soaking your, your seeds, and I, I really think that when people are watering plants indoors, overwatering is probably the number one mistake that you can make. Um, and that can um, create a whole host of problems and including um, uh, really damp, wet situations, really a lot of pathogens really like that kind of, of scene. And then um, if you let your really fragile seedlings dry out, then also they have a risk of dying. So just find that happy medium. And you'll learn, You're, you might mess some things up. Trust me, I've messed plenty of things up um, when I was learning. Um, but your, your plants will let you know if they're happy or not. You may need to thin. So you can see here, you've got um, a couple of plants per cell as much as it would hurt. Um, go ahead and tear one of those out to get a one really healthy transplant. And transplant your seedlings into bigger containers um, when the seedlings are starting to grow big and strong. And we'll talk about the transplanting um, process a little later. So some additional thoughts about um, starting seeds at home is um, know what you're buying and what your kind of end goal is. So if you're looking to um, buy some seeds, start them at home, grow them out in your garden and then save your seeds, and share them with your friends. Make sure that you're buying, look for open pollinated seeds um, because those are going to be true to the parent plant. Heirloom seeds are basically open pollinated seeds, but heirloom seeds usually come with a story. So that's like the main difference. Um, hybrid seeds are really common in the seed catalogs. There's nothing wrong with hybrid seeds. Um, what is happening with a hybrid seed is that they are bred 
by um, plant breeders um, for certain characteristics like um, increased vigor. And um, the thing with hybrid seeds that you should remember is that they will not be true to the parent plant if you are um, wanting to save seeds from your garden year after year. Buy from reputable sources because they're gonna have all that great information that I already talked about earlier. Read your packet, read your packet, and read your packet. Um, make tags, I can't stress this enough. Um, when your seeds germinate, so here's a photo of some Genovese basil that I started at the Arboretum. And the way that I have this organized was that um, each of these rows was all Genovese basil. And I have all of the rows labeled with the, the, day, the date that I started the plant. Um, and you can see here, I've got some spaces and I probably have another um, something else growing over here because um, I didn't want to get them mixed up. So they will all look the same when they germinate. So um, just label them. And keeping a journal is going to be so important. And I learned my lesson the hard way um, with this when I started doing some vegetable production at the Arboretum. Um, so I grew mostly native plants while I was there, but I did start growing um, some veggies at some point for our plant sales. And we had a database that was, uh, that had um, cultural information from the 80s. So if I was growing a species of penstemon, I could look back in there and say, hey, what did they do to get the best germination with this particular plant, right? So we kept really, really good records. Well, when I started growing vegetables, I was like, oh, this will be so much easier than growing native plants. And I kept no notes. And I thought that the next year I would remember when I planted or when I started my tomato seeds and when I started the basil and if it was ready or not and whether or not I had problems. I thought I would remember all of that. And then a year later, I remembered absolutely nothing. So I pretty much had to start all over. So like Jim says, keeping a journal is just really gonna help you remember what you did the year before and it's just gonna make you a better gardener and a better grower. So again, I don't do the same thing that I did, keep a journal. It's gonna help you plan for next year. It's really gonna help you narrow down your timing. Um, what varieties worked best for you, um, what worked, what didn't work. Um, it'll help you with um, crop rotation if you're you know, keeping a journal big picture in your garden. So you, if you have a really big space, you can remember what you planted where and then um, record any diseases and problems that you may have experienced. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to growing media. I've talked about this a, a little bit in the talk, but I never really told you what growing media is. So the growing media is basically just the material that your plants grow in. So you'll see this um, as either growing medium or growing media. And it has three main functions. So you can kind of think of it as a fictitious soil. And growing media is going to do the same some of the same things that a soil will do out in your garden. So growing media supplies your, the plant's roots with nutrients, air, and water. It allows for maximum root growth and growing media physically supports the plant. And there are loads of options for growing media when you're shopping. So here I just put um, a couple of examples on this slide. So you can see here's um, a seed starting mix that's made by miracle Grow. Here's um, black gold seedling mix. You can find this. I know that Warner's has it. This is has that Omri label on it. So that means it's um, organic, approved for organic growing. Here's another seedling mix. I, I've never seen this out, but I just pulled it off a lot off of the internet. Um, just so you could see that there are lots of examples. And then here's um, a growing media that somebody is about to make on their own. So we'll look at some do-it-yourself 
growing medias. And then here's a potting soil. Um, this is another type of growing media. This is Sunshine 4. I really liked to use that at the Arboretum. It's a really nice mix. Hey Gail, this is Hattie. Hi Hattie. Frank has a question. Uh -huh. Frank, you wanna ask your question? If you mean me, I don't have a question, but maybe there's another Frank. Oh, sorry. I thought your hand was raised. I'm sorry. Never mind. You know me. Put I you on the spot. How to work this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to work this. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. So here is a um, an example of. Um, a seed starting mix that you can make on your own. And we'll talk about um, some advantages of making your own versus some advantages of buying a commercially made mix. But the most important thing to remember if you are making your own mix is that you want to use um, sterile material because you do not, you want to avoid um, soils from your garden because one, they could be too heavy to um, start your seeds. Also, they could contain a lot of pathogens and pests that um, you do not want to introduce in your, into your um, propagation situation. So here's one that I use um, in several uh, places where I've worked or gone to school. So um, for starting seeds, this is a nice light mix of half perlite and half either vermiculite or peat moss. Peat moss is probably easier to find and it's a lot cheaper, but it's gonna serve the same purpose as um, vermiculite. So perlite is, you've probably all seen it. It's that white stuff that's in your um, potting soil mix. And what perlite is, is it's a volcanic rock that gets heated up to super high temperatures and to where it's kind of, you can think of it as popped like popcorn. And what perlite serves in your mix is that it provides um, aeration and, and drainage in there. So vermiculite or um, peat moss is going to be your other half. And vermiculite is a mineral that's similar to mica. I've got a picture of it right here. Um, and we'll look at a picture of peat moss and uh, on the next slide. But what vermiculite and, or peat moss do is it helps to retain moisture and um, makes um, holds the nutrients in there so it's not just um, running out of your pots and not available for your plants. But there are no nutrients in this sterile mix when you're using perlite or um, vermiculite and peat moss. There's no nutritional value in there. So that's one of the main um, advantages for buying uh, a commercially made seedling mix because they have a lot of other really great stuff in there that will make your plants happy, including fertilizers, um, wetting agents, and pH adjustments. So wetting agents, if you see that, so peat moss is hydrophobic, and that means um, that once it dries out, it is really, really hard to get wet again. So I don't know if you have old bags of potting soil um, around the house like I do. Um, once they dry out, um, it's really, really hard to get that peat moss wet again. So that's why um, a lot of these commercial mixes will have a wetting agent in there. So um, to help that peat moss from drying out. pH adjustment is going to be really important because uh, peat moss, which is typically the, the main bulk ingredient in these um, commercial seedling mixes, um, it, peat moss is, is very acidic and um, your plants are going to like the pH um, to be a little higher than what um, the pH of a peat moss is. And Frank is gonna talk all about pH um, next week when, he, when we talk about soils and soil amendments. So is potting soil really soil? Not at all. So it's a growing media or medium and it's just a fictitious soil. So in our, in our greenhouses or in our home growing situations, we're just kind of, we want to provide that substrate and all of the things that soil does, but potting soil is not 
soil at all. So it's a soilless media that typically contains peat moss or peat substitutes like uh, coco core. Um, it can contain compost. Um, typically it has perlite in it and or vermiculite. Sometimes you can find in those potting soils as well. So um, like the seed starting mix, you can um, make your own or you can buy it commercially. So here's a potting soil mix that we used to use when I was at Yavapai College. And it was um, three, three parts uh, peat moss to one part um, perlite. But the thing is, is that remember, there is no nutrients in, in that mix. So we had a supplemental um, uh, fertilizer plants and we did that through a fertigation system. So fertilizing, fertilizer was going through our irrigation system and water providing the plants with the um, fertilizers that they need. So here's another advantage for, for buying those commercially made potting soil. So they have fertilizers typically in there, um, at least for a little bit. I've seen it for, you know, as short as two weeks, and then you have to start introducing um, your fertilizers, or um, I have a couple of uh, bags at home that say uh, it has enough fertilizer for up to six months. So read your bag. Again, you're going to have those wetting agents in there, and then um, pH adjustment you typically see in those commercially made potting soils. So next we're gonna talk about um, transplanting. You might not have to do this depending on the containers that um, you started your seeds in, um, but if your plants are starting to get too big for the container and you still have a little ways to go to plant out into your garden, you most likely, likely will have to transplant. So transplanting optimizes plant growth. Um, it gets it into the, your plants into new media um, with those added nutrients. And for seedlings, it's best to transplant plants after the first true leaves appear. We looked at that. And then remember to be gentle, gentle with um, young roots because you can do um, some damage there. We looked at some um, reusable containers that we can find in our kitchen, but there are also lots and lots of options out there to buy containers um, commercially. Um, for this was my, these are not vegetables, but this was my system um, at the Arboretum for starting seeds. So I was always pressed for space. So I would start my seedlings in a cell tray like that. And then also um, I was dealing with a lot of mortality um, because I grew native plants. So you can just pretty much count on all, some of them dying. So in order to save space and re the resource of potting soil, I would move them into these um, two inch pots. And then when they um, got really nice and big and strong, then they graduated up into these um, four inch pots. So you probably wouldn't be getting um, much bigger than a four inch size pot when you're starting your own vegetables in your house for transplants. So the last step that you should do before you plant your, your transplants into your garden is to harden them off. Now, this is a really, really important step. We live in a really challenging, harsh environment here in Northern Arizona. And if you take your plants, your brand new baby, super soft plants out of your greenhouse or out of your home situation and plant them directly into your garden, garden outside, they will most likely die or not be very, very ha happy at all. So you have to harden your plants off. And this is just slowly introducing um, the plant to the outdoor elements. So our um, intense light, our wind, our temperature ranges, changes. So um, in your greenhouse, you're providing a, the perf most perfect situation um, for your plants. There's no wind. Um, you're giving them just enough light, just enough water. So um, before you put them into your garden, um, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do, so hardening your plants off is takes a couple steps and usually about seven to 10 days um, 
you'll be ready to put your plants outside in your garden. So during the first few days, you're gonna wanna put your plants outside in a shady area and then um, bring them back inside at night. Then for the next few days, you want to slowly introduce your plants to um, the natural light. So I would avoid doing this in the middle of the day when the sun is very intense. So maybe start slowly with like the morning light or the evening light. And then um, depending on the temperatures, then you can start leaving your plants outside at night and then eventually introduce more light to your plants. So then, then you can start putting them outside during the warmest part of the day in that full sunlight. So then after about seven to 10 days, your plant should be acclimated to the outdoor environment and ready to be transplanted. When you plant your plants in the ground, mulching, especially in our arid climate is going to be really important. So mulch, as Jim talked about last week, helps to retain your soil moisture. It also will help minimize weeds if you mulch thick enough. Um, it can help warm the soil if you're using an, an inorganic mulch, like a plastic mulch. So I'll show you pictures of that. Um, but organic, products. So organic mulches like straw, wood chips, pine needles, and um, compost can, well, I don't know if compost would keep the soil cooler, but all of those will keep the soil at a cooler temperature. Um, one advantage of um, mulching or top dressing with compost is that it can add um, those nutrients into your soil. I did top dress with, with, um, with compost last year um, and then it all blew off in the wind. So most of it did. So I don't know if I would do that again because it was kind of sad to see that compost get totally blown off of my garden after all the work it took to make it. So here's some pictures of um, plastic mulches. Um, remember inorganic mulches are going to um, help you with warming the soil. And here's an example of an organic mulch. So this is, I believe this is one of Jim's pictures. And I've done this before with um, burlap, especially when I've um, sown really teeny tiny um, carrot seeds. And um, this seemed to work really great. I think Jim does this as well. And that's all I'm gonna say about mulches. I really wanted to talk more about container gardening. Jim talked about it last week, but sometimes here in um, Northern Arizona, container gardening may be our only option. And someone last week asked about, you know, what if you have a really small space, like you live in an apartment and you just have a balcony? Well, container gardening is going to be a really great option for you. And you could grow tons of food, veggies in container gardens. So you can grow greens, herbs, um, edible flowers, tomatoes do really well in containers here, eggplants, peppers, um, cucumbers, potatoes, and peas all do well in containers. So just like um, starting seeds in containers, um, any pot can become a container garden as long as it has drainage. So you can repurpose a lot of stuff at home or you can buy really you know pretty decorative um, pots to grow your food in. So um, you can reuse products like um, five gallon buckets. We'll look at some pictures of tomatoes growing in five gallon buckets, um, wooden pallets. I've seen people use bathtubs as a container garden, sheep troughs, um, wheelbarrows. Um, just remember that size and color are going to um, matter. Small pots, especially here, are going to dry out really, really fast. And dark colors could um, heat up your pot in sunny spots and um, could um, damage your plants. Um, materials, you're gonna wanna look for lightweight materials if you plan to relocate your pot. So um, sometimes we have to do that in Northern Arizona, especially on the shoulder seasons, you might need to move your tomato plants to a protected area if you've got them in containers or I've moved them into my garden or into my garage in the evenings before a frost. Just remember drainage holes are a must. 
And it's best to fill these containers with potting soil and um, not native soil. One thing that I wanna talk about with container gardening, gardening is um, the uh, perched water table. So we get a lot of questions of whether or not you should put rocks at the bottom of your pot. And what all that's doing is one, making your pot super heavy to move around. So there goes the um, advantage of um, having something that's mobile, but it also creates a perched water table, which happens naturally um, in pots anyway. So at the bottom of these pots, even though there's holes in them, the soil will get um, too wet and saturated because the, the pores in the soil will start to um, fill up with water. So when you add gravel to the bottom of the pot, all that it's doing is raising that perched water table. So then um, it's giving your plants less room for the roots to grow. So recommend against adding gravel. So here's a picture of five gallon buckets that are, um, that have tomatoes growing in them. And then here's um, another type of container that I've found that would be really easy to move around if you have a friend, of course, and they're not too heavy. They've got handles on them. So those are pretty easy to find. Just remember when you're container gardening, um, you have to provide enough, um, enough depth in order for um, your plants to have um, healthy root growth. So, um, this information is, is um, online, but um, in general, remember that tomatoes need a lot more depth. Um, so they like to have 14 inches or, or more, and these are just um, averages. But um, some of your more shallow crops would include chives and lettuce and radishes, um, a little deeper, beans, garlic, kohlrabi, onions, um, pole beans, carrots, chard, cucumber. Now we're starting to get a little deeper. Um, beets, like Jim talked about, you're gonna want um, some deeper, provide deeper soil for that. And then tomatoes, um, five gallon buckets are really great for tomatoes. So my last piece of advice about container gardening is that when you plant a puppy, make sure that the container can comfortably ac accommodate the full grown dog. So remember, think about the full grown product when you're planting in a container. Here's a picture of a raised bed here in Flagstaff. Um, a lot of times um, we just have to grow, um, just build up in our gardens because we're either gardening on, on top of limestone or maybe you're in a situation like this where there's um, a sidewalk but you still wanna put a garden in there. Here's a really great uh, picture of a container garden or a raised bed where you don't have to bend over anymore. Maybe, maybe you don't wanna bend over and, or you can't. And like Jim talked about, you can make, last week you can make raised beds accessible for folks who are um, in wheelchairs. So maybe if this wasn't here on the bottom, that shelf, then you could um, get a wheelchair under, under there. Here's a picture of our bus stop garden in front of the Cooperative Extension Office. And Hattie mentioned last week that um, the, this bed was, um, our bed there is made out of um, pine logs, recycled pine logs. This looks like an older um, picture, but now we've got um, recycled pine logs there. And look at, this is probably some of the worst soil in Flagstaff. It's pretty much just cinders. So um, we did a raised bed there or raised beds. Here's some um, pine logs right here. This is the Juniper Street Community Garden in Flagstaff. So where do you get soil for your raised beds? People ask this a lot. Um, Hattie really likes this um, Kellogg's raised bed and potting mix and you can get that at Home Depot. It's a really nice product. I like it as well. Um, that gets really expensive though, if you are filling up a, a big space. So you can make your own. And here in Flagstaff, you can get um, what they call top soil. Um, we don't really have much top soil. So um, we're kind of baffled where 
where they get it, but they have a mine and they um, uh, amend that topsoil with 20% um, um, composted mule manure from the mules at Grand Canyon, which is really cool. And you can order that by the cubic yard. Um, and I've used that in my um, raised beds, but I also put other um, amendments in there, um, organic um, matter, like I've used peat moss. I've, I've used a lot of different things that Frank is gonna talk about um, next week, but just know that you can um, pick that up from the landscape connection here in Flagstaff. Um, here's some recipes from a U of A publication. There are um, a lot of different recipes that are, that are out there in order for you to make um, large amounts of um, potting soil or, or uh, for your garden. So here I'm just gonna talk um, briefly about fertilizers. So um, when you're buying a fertilizer, again, um, read the label because there's really important stuff on there and not all fertilizers are created equal. So one thing that you should really pay attention to is um, these three numbers right here. So it's, this is going to be your N, P, and K. And that's just going to tell you the percent by weight of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium um, in your product. Um, there may be other nutrients in there that um, could be specified, but these, the NPK is always on there. So read the bag and know what you're buying because there are a lot, a lot of different types of fertilizer. So a complete fertilizer contains all three of the primary nutrients that we just talked about. So you can see 16, 16, 16 here. Jim talked about that last week. Um, this is 2904. Um, so just look for those three numbers and um, that's gonna be the NPK and an incomplete fertilizer is something uh, where there's one of those primary nutrients missing, which is example right here for this um, lawn fertilizer. You can get um, a fertilizer that acidifies soil for certain plants like blueberries um, that we don't recommend you grow here in Flagstaff. Um, you can find options for slow release fertilizer. So that's just where um, a lot of times it's, uh, like Osmocote is a pelleted slow release fertilizer and it does just that. It slowly releases um, the fertilizer over time. You can also find fertilizer pesticide combinations out there. We also don't really recommend those because um, um, treating your pests and Hattie will talk, is gonna give a whole class on this, um, is going to really depend on the life cycle of your pest. Other um, options for fertilizers out there um, are going to be synthetic versus organic fertilizers. So um, organic fertilizers, so we're not talking about like certified organic here, we're talking about products that are remains or byproducts of plants or animals versus a synthetic fertilizer, um, which is something that is a chemical or something that is, is a product that's um, mined. So um, there are advantages and disadvantages of each of these. Um, with synthetic fertilizers, they're usually less expensive. Um, they're not as bulky as your organic um, products. Um, the nutrients are available um, quickly for, for your plants. So if you're noticing a problem in your garden and you uh, put down a synthetic fertilizer, it's going to be available a lot faster for your plants to hopefully maybe resolve the problem. Um, but on the flip side of that is that there's greater potential um, to um, burn your plants um, by adding um, too much fertilizer and um, synthetic fertilizers can cause pollution. Um, your organic products, some examples are um, cottonseed meal, blood meal, fish meal, um, manures. These are usually more expensive. Um, they're bulkier 
than the synthetic products. Um, and that's because there's relatively low nutrient content in the organic fertilizers. So that means that you typically um, have to add more. Um, organic fertilizers typically will um, contain some other micronutrients that are going to um, be really beneficial for your plants. Um, they are not um, as quickly available for your plant like the synthetic are, but then you're um, lowering that burn potential when you're applying this type of product. These products usually um, condition the soil by adding organic matter. So there's something even um, better um, for using organic um, materials. Frank's gonna talk about soil amendments um, next week. And these organic materials usually can help benefit the microorganisms that are working hard in your garden. And of course, they can also cause pollution if they're not applied correctly. So again, um, read your label because there are a lot of different options out there. Um, there are op, um, fertilizers that are going to um, be specific for vegetables and tomatoes. So um, if you have a leftover lawn fertilizer in your garage and you're thinking, well, shoot, my tomato plants, I'm just gonna fertilize them. Well, what you're doing is putting on way too much nitrogen um, onto your tomato plants. And what that's gonna do is you're just gonna get really big, lush, beautiful plants. Um, and you're probably not gonna get a whole lot of flowers or fruit. So read your products, make sure you're applying them correctly and what uh, applying them for what they were made for. So when do you add fertilizer? A lot of people ask this. Well, of course, it's, it's all going to depend on what you're growing, what, what time of year it is. So um, we're going to talk way more about amendments next week. But um, like Jim said last week, you um, add your um, nutrients in the fall if, the, if you're um, adding more of like soil amendments. So um, your materials that aren't really composted down, um, vegetable scraps, um, manures, um, that way you're giving time for that stuff to, to break down because um, you definitely don't want to add manures that are not composted onto your plants in the spring because you will definitely burn them. So you can add fertilizers in the spring as soon as the soil can be worked and that this is when you're going to want to add your composted materials or some of your um, store-bought products. Um, but also, again, it depends on what you're using and what you're growing. So read your label. And um, organic fertilizers, remember, they tend to be more bulky and um, they need to be added more often. And again, read your label. So here's a slide about um, watering. So how much do you water and how often do you water? Um, the person who teaches our um, master gardener class on water management, he has this really simple rule um, for watering that you should think about and it's the one, two, three rule. And what that is, it's just really easy to remember. You wanna go one foot deep for your smaller plants. So say your perennial vegetables or your perennial plants. I know this is all about um, veggies, but just in general, just so you can remember this. And then he says to go two feet deep for shrubs and three feet down for trees. So you want to deliver your water to the roots of your plants. And how often are you going to water? Well, it's really going to um, depend on the weather. Um, during so if it's really, really, really hot during the summer, you may need to add water twice a day. Um, the morning and the evening are the best times to add water. Um, and you wanna avoid watering in the middle of the day because that water is just, like Jim said last week, um, it, it um, could just evaporate. 
we recommend um, drip irrigation here in the arid west. It's the most efficient type of watering that we can do in the desert. So um, last week, Jim talked about um, drip a little bit. He talked about um, sprinkler system. So like he said, don't waste your time. With the wind that we have here um, and just how dry the air is, that water is probably not going to want, probably is not gonna go where you want it to go. Drip irrigation is pre precision. So you can see here, we um, here's an emitter and the water is just dripping right down into the soil. Drip irrigation is customizable. So you can buy different emitters for um, different, it's usually expressed in gallons per minute. Um, the soaker hoses are also really great. So all, what this is doing is putting the water down exactly where you want it to go. And the other way that you can hand water or the other way that you can water your garden is to hand water. And it's okay to do this. I mean, there's, I think the two biggest advantages of hand watering is that one, you can look at your plants every day so you can really monitor what is going on with them. And then, you know, because sometimes with your drip irrigation, things go wrong. And if you're not checking on your plants and you're think, or you're on vacation or something, and you're thinking that water is being delivered and, you know, there's a break in the line or something and you don't notice it for a while. Well, by the time you catch it, um, your plants could be dead. So that's one advantage of hand watering. And it can be relaxing, you know, I. During COVID, I've been sitting at a desk all day long and, um, or even before COVID when I was in the office sitting at the computer, um, sometimes it was nice to go outside and, and hand water the garden and um, it can be really relaxing. But it is definitely time consuming and it is definitely not as efficient as drip. And this year is going to be the year that I put in a drip system because I have been watering my garden by hand for many years. And um, sometimes I could be standing there for like an hour and I move away the mulch, move the mulch away from my plants and it's like dust underneath it. So, um, so one, it kind of wasted water and it just, it took a long time. So, um, Patty, when she put her drip system in her garden, her water bill actually went down. So just um, keep that in mind. If you want to learn more, we're not gonna talk about irrigation in this series. Um, Hattie and I did a video last year that you can view on our uh, Coconino County YouTube page. And it's all about how simple it is to purchase a drip irrigation um, kit and install it at your house. And it, your plants are gonna be really happy if, if you do that. So with that, um, that is the end of my presentation. And I just wanted to leave um, some time for questions, but I'm sure with, with Hattie here, She's probably um, addressed a lot of your questions, but um, we can have a little conversation if, if you want. So Gail, I did answer some of the questions, but um, there is a really good one. There's a couple questions here. And somebody asked about um, <clears throat> growing your seedlings in a greenhouse. And Leslie, if you want to ask this question, um, you can jump in now. But um, uh, you know, just because greenhouses can get pretty hot during the day, but then they can be very cold at night. And um, how and I don't remember if you're talking about greenhouses at all in this series. So that's part of our master gardener class. 
but Gail can answer that question. Oh, Leslie says she doesn't have a mic. I think I got the question right. So was she asking just in general about? Yeah, stuff? and would you have to take your seedlings in during the day or mm -hmm. you know at night because it's so cold at night? Um, you know, of course, <clears throat> greenhouses, that's one of the problems is temperature control. It's, it's a huge problem. So I'll just use um, one of the greenhouses at the Arboretum that I used, it was very old. And a lot of the, uh, well, all of the temperature controllers um, did not work anymore. So what I would see in there was that it would get up to, so this is in the winter time, I, I was tracking the temperature swings. It would get up to a hundred degrees in there in the winter time and then um, well below freezing at night. So um, without that type of climate control, especially up here at elevation, you're going to have to um, make some adjustments. So um, one of our master gardeners, Jackie Alston, who's presenting in a couple of weeks in her greenhouse, when she's um, sowing, starting her seeds, um, she'll put those solar decorative lights in there. And she says that those put off enough heat in her little space um, to uh, keep the plants um, at the temperature that they need to um, be at for germination and then also to protect them from, from the cold. But again, you know, just keep your, pay attention to the weather because if it's getting like well below freezing, we have a big cold snap, you might just have to um, bring them inside. And then of course, you know, use uh, row covers and all of the things that Jackie's gonna um, talk about um, when she does her season extenders. So there, there are tricks that you can, can do. And Jackie will talk about that. Oh, you're muted, Hattie. Number one phrase of the of the year. Yeah. <laughs> and you just can't believe you forget. Um, Carme asks, can you talk a little bit more about the, the different need of the NPK and when to add more of one or the other at different times of plant, of the plant's growth? That's a good question. It is. Will you answer it, Hattie? Because you'll do a much better job than me. Aren't it? <laughs> so if you're planting in your garden soil um, often we have enough phosphorus and enough potassium sometimes it's good to add a little bit more phosphorus but phosphorus um, doesn't leach out of the soil so if, if you're adding it in the springtime when you're getting the beds ready you should never have to add phosphorus again and we do have plenty of potassium. I've only heard of a couple situations where people haven't had enough potassium and they're just really unusual situations. You do need to add nitrogen and oftentimes that's something that you know your garden's growing it's okay May and June and then in July it's not doing so great and probably a dose of nitrogen would really help and you can do that by um, side dressing with comp compost or composted manure or you can um, side dress with something like um, blood meal or something. And so, you know, and you can also use a liquid fertilizer and I have used miracle Grow, but I really don't think it works that great. But sometimes you're like, oh, my plants look terrible and you just grab something. So, um, but thinking about July, the plants are actively growing, the monsoon started, they're putting on a lot of growth, they're getting ready to, you know, put on, <clears throat> grow fruit and you know you just don't want to add too much nitrogen because you know for something like a tomato if you do you're not going to have um, flowers so it is a little bit of a challenge the soil test um, the little home kits for nitrogen it, it's a guesstimate um, but I think kind of getting to know your plants and and you know if they seem like they're not thriving as much you know side dressing with compost could really help that is that enough of an answer? 
Okay. Somebody asked about using Thrive. I'm not sure what Thrive is, if that's a B1 vitamin. <clears throat> I don't I know what Thrive think. is. Yeah, but um, there is somebody, she's from Oregon and she's the garden myth buster. And so if you're curious about some of these products, and um, I just actually pulled a book because I'm getting ready to give the pest and disease talk for Paige tomorrow night. So I pulled um, the myth about, or the truth about organic gardening. And he's one of the person that does work at, on myth busting. And anyway, um, this Linda, um, Linda Chauncer from Oregon State, um, <clears throat> she says that a lot of these products like Thrive, which I think are B vitamins, usually don't work a whole lot. But what, but what she does is when she presents that argument, she says, this is the science of the product and this is why or why it may not work. And so it's a really good way to get information. And so there's a lot of stuff out there for sale and we're willing to buy it because we all wanna be gardeners and we wanna be great gardeners, but some of it doesn't really do anything. But I do think sometimes that we pay more attention to our gardens when we're buying these products and we're adding them. And, um, and so that is something to think about. And there might be some micronutrient that's you know needed, but in general, we don't have that problem in Northern Arizona. We have a problem with nitrogen. We have a problem with a lack of organic matter, or we have a problem with just having way too many rocks and not enough soil. So Gail, are you looking at the chat now? No, but I can. I, I can do that for you if you want me to. So Cindy did ask about getting soil from the landscape connection. And we do get a, several questions into the extension office. Like, well, I have like, like three inches of soil on top of limestone or you know bedrock or something like that. And so what do you do? And so if you're making a great big raised bed, what do you fill that raised bed with? And in general, I like to see real soil in the bed and maybe supplemented with potting soil, but where do you get that stuff? And so the landscape connection does have soil. I don't know if you can, it's out past the mall. I don't know if you can just drive over there, fill up the back of your minivan um, you that you glide with plastic and drive it home. I don't know about that. I have purchased um, trucks of, they call it topsoil, but it's not necessarily topsoil. It's something that's been screened. So it has a finer texture. Um, but that's what we have because we don't have a lot of topsoil here. And um, so I actually don't know that that might be something that would be interesting to um, find out. I did for the, this master gardener class that we're currently um, running. I said, we got a pile of topsoil that's at the office. If anybody wants it, come get it. And two people came by and put it in the back of their trucks. And so sometimes you might if you see somebody that has a landscaping project or a house that's being built and they have extra stuff, ask them because the contractor is gonna to have to get rid of that stuff. And so I believe what we're getting when we buy topsoil is the stuff from a building project that's been screened down to take out all the rocks. So you're still gonna add, it's probably not gonna have organic matter. You're gonna to have to add a lot of organic matter, but having that mineral component provides a lot of those micronutrients. Um, and of course, a good potting soil will also have those micronutrients too. But then, you know, you have to keep adding nutrients every year if you're using potting soil because you're going to use up all those nutrients that first year that you use your potting soil. So it's hard. It's a hard question. And Cindy's working on it. And we're going to have an article about it. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> You can, so I've, I've gotten the potting or the, the soil with the 20% mule manure from the landscape connection. They will deliver it to you, um, depending on, they'll charge you on, depending on where you're getting it delivered to. So where in town. So for example, I used, sometimes I would get it at the Arboretum and it costs a lot more to have it delivered out there. Um, but you could, they'll also, sell it by the five gallon bucket. So you can bring five gallon buckets there 
or they have, um, if you have a truck uh, or a trailer, they will do a couple big scoops for you and um, you can take it home that way. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Got that, Cindy? Good. And then um, I see a question from Victoria Patton and she's asking about water columns for a greenhouse. And um, the Arboretum actually had this. And it, so what they're doing basically is providing some sort of thermal mass. And that will help regulate the temperature of, of the greenhouse. So you can um, fill up uh, barrels, black barrels work well, put yeah. them on the north side of your, your greenhouse. So that um, the southern exposure where the windows are will bring in that sunlight. It'll hit the water columns or the black buckets, whatever you have, and that will absorb um, the heat and help cool the greenhouse during the day. And then that heat will um, get released in the evening to help regulate that temperature. But I will say at the Arboretum, we had a bunch of big, so if you wanna see cool examples, go check out the older greenhouse at the Arboretum. Um, that was the idea behind the design, but I still had to have supplemental heat in there. We had a, a, um, a pellet stove. So that was not enough in that big space to regulate the temperature. Gail, yeah, we have a question about planting. Somebody planted garlic and onion and uh, they're popping up now. What kind of temperatures will they survive? They they can handle it pretty cold, can't they, Hattie? They can, but I, I, I just decided to look it up. So I just looked up the temperature on my phone. So it's gonna go down to 18 degrees. So I think um, for Katie, it depends what microclimate you're in. And if you're in a warmer part of town, you'll probably be okay. Um, at my house, you know, I'm in University Highlands. It's usually the same temperature that we see reported in the newspaper. Um, it'll probably be 18 degrees. And new little plants that are just beginning to grow, 18 degrees is kind of cold for them. I'd say anything over 20, 25, they're going to be fine. But you know, we're going to have some cold weather. I would buy some floating row cover and I would cover them for a couple of days um, because they're still just beginning to grow. And so they haven't had a chance to really, you know, be really, really hardy. And, and it's just something that, you know, well, you don't want to go out and buy floating row cover. Do you have any extra polyester fabric in your sewing kit? Or do you have old shower curtains that are made out of polyester? Anything like that. And I have sometimes just turned plastic black buckets or um, pots on top of plants, putting a rock on top so they don't blow away to Winslow, um, <laughs> just to get them through these next couple nights. And then they'll probably be fine, but it's just because they're kind of new and it is gonna be cold at night for the next couple of days. Yeah, an old polyester tablecloth, that's great. Um, I do, when I first moved here, I covered everything with these old polyester sheets we had from college and at the most interesting looking front yard. Somebody asked about an arrow garden as a seed starter. Like aeroponics? Aero yeah, there's these gardens you can buy. I'd say it's fine if you have one. I probably wouldn't buy one just because they're kind of expensive. But if you have one, it does have lights. And it could be a great way to get things started. Right. Okay. Let's see. Patty? Yes. I did actually mean to raise my hand that time. I'm learning <laughs> <laughs> two things. <laughs> I my garlic and uh, onions are up, but they were planted in the fall, and I guess they survived 14 degrees last night. But I may cover them for this storm. The other thing about buying uh, soil from Landscape Connection, um, I bought some years ago. It's pretty terrible. I'd say it's mostly silt. And I didn't have the manure added to it. 
took a couple of years of adding compost to it for it to be very good, but now it's part of my garden and it works okay. Um, but I was, Gail had mentioned people trying to grow in straight sand and page. And I'm like, if I was growing in straight sand, I might add some of that silt to it. But um, anyway, that's just my experience with it. Yeah. I think your point about, you know, plants that were planted in the fall, you know, I don't think they have as much new growth. It, and it just, it just depends when Katie planted them. And, um, you know, if they're just a week or two old, they're still going to be kind of a little delicate maybe. And so um, just kind of, you know, I would pay attention. Um, but I also feel like if it's really easy to throw something over them, just in case, because sometimes we get crazy weather. Burn. <laughs> so. I oh, baby mine all through December and January, good. frost cloth, mulch, all, you know, but now they seem okay. Good. All right. Well, it's um, 6.58 and I can smell somebody cooking me dinner. So <laughs> hopefully I'll start smelling a fire from the fireplace pretty soon too. And um with that, I think we can be finished. And next week we have Frank is going to be presenting on soil and soil amendments. So everybody um, tune in for that, it should be really good. Frank is great. And um, yeah, if you miss any of the classes, we're gonna put them up on our YouTube channel. And have a good night. And thank you, Hattie. Thanks, Gail. Good Thank night. you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Stay warm. Thank you. Good night. See ya. Bye.